Welcome. We're here today to talk about Forefoot and Toe Edema, sponsored by 3M Healthcare. With a prevalence of 3.9 per thousand in the adult population and raising to 30 per thousand in the very elderly, this really is becoming an increasing problem within the UK. I'm joined today by Christine Moffat, nurse consultant at Derby Lymphedema Service and professor at Nottingham University, along with Denise Hardy, nurse consultant with an independent practice in Kendall, Cumbria, and now I'm going to pass over to Christine for the discussion. I'm very delighted to be asked to talk about the problem of managing toe and foot edema. It's a problem that we're seeing in lymphedema services throughout the UK and uh, really challenges us very much. The objectives for this session are firstly to understand the progression of chronic edema of the foot and toes and how it presents in different clinical scenarios to look at uh, the complications that occur and why they occur, and to define the strategies used in effective management, particularly skin care and wound management, uh, treatment of complications, and the very important central role of compression therapy. So firstly, we have to ask ourselves, why does toe and forefoot edema occur at all? Um, partly, it's the pathological process. If you have somebody with lymphatic failure, then edema will be uh, worsened because of that failure, and many factors will exacerbate that. In patients who have venous disease, um, ambulatory venous hypertension, again, will lead to uh, development of chronic edema in the foot particularly. Um, so there's a number of pathological processes that come together to exacerbate the problem of edema development. And increasingly, we're understanding that um, Factors such as immobility and infection are also very important. Immobility, because patients uh, are often very um, sitting in dependent positions with their legs hanging down, failing to elevate, and the effects of gravity are very powerful uh, stimulus for the development of foot edema. And we know from infection as well that uh, infection leads to edema, but it also has a further complicating factor of actually uh, damaging the lymphatics even more. And perhaps something less well known is that uh, the wrong use of compression therapy, a failure to understand uh, the management of the foot in terms of compression itself can be uh, why patients develop toe and forefoot edema. And it's very important to understand that when we use compression, if we are using it on the foot and toes, and we're not applying compression to, the, to this area adequately, that compression itself will force edema into the non-compressed areas such as the toes and foot. foot. And this in turn leads to skin changes occurring. So I've got some uh, examples uh, from clinical practice that really just highlight the progression of chronic edema. If you look at the picture uh, on the top row on the left hand side, this is quite a mild early onset chronic edema. It's often a situation where the patient does not know they have a problem and professionals are often not looking for this as well. So it's quite insidious um, and it's not causing anybody a problem uh, at all. And it's often the development of complications that picks up forefoot edema as an issue. If we look at the picture in the middle at the top, again, you can see the edema is developing further. You can see the tissue changes occurring. There's very evident edema occurring in the foot and the toes. And the picture on the right at the top, by now you've got established chronic edema. You've got enhanced skin folds. Um, there's what we call a positive stem as sign, so you're unable to pick up a pinch of skin at the base of the second toe. Very clear indication of established chronic edema. Moving to the bottom line of, of pictures on the left-hand side, again, you can see that as the edema develops, so you're developing skin changes such as hyperkeratosis, which is a buildup of the outer layer of the skin. Um, and as the progression occurs even further, we see um, this worsening. So if you move to the uh, bottom picture on the right-hand side, this is a very end stage of chronic edema, where the toes have almost lost their definition um, there's very pronounced uh, lymphatic changes. We've got papilloma, uh, and the toes are actually webbed together. So we really do need to understand that if we ignore the progression of chronic edema in the forefoot, we can end up having a picture such as we see in the bottom right hand. Uh, venous ulceration is also something that has not been understood in terms of its importance in, in terms of chronic edema. 
But we know that um, with venous ulceration, the cause is due to either deep vein thrombosis or varicose veins, and often it's a complication of those factors in patients. And it's also exacerbated with immobility, where there's a failure of the calf muscle pump to be used. But we also know that traditionally, venous ulcer management with compression therapy has focused on bandaging from the base of the toes to the knee. And I draw your attention to the picture in the middle of this slide, because this is really what happens when compression is inappropriately used. So edema is being trapped. We have severe infection occurring. This patient now has underlying osteomyelitis occurring. But the underlying pathological process of the condition of this patient is still venous ulceration. So we really do need to understand that chronic edema of the foot and toes is very much part and parcel of venous ulceration. So we need to think about this in terms of our management strategies. We also see uh, chronic edema in patients, uh, younger patients. This is an example of a patient with spina bifida. And young disabled patients who are very immobile, who have loss of muscle tone in this particular patient, there is no muscle tone due to their um, spinal injury from spina bifida. And increasingly we see these patients, they are not told about chronic edema being a consequence of gravity, and that's essentially what's happening. And these tissue changes that are occurring can be very profound. This patient has been living with a spina bifida for 20 years, and you can see that the forefoot is extremely distended, the toes um, have become distorted, and uh, this is a chronic edema situation, um, which is affecting many, many young disabled patients. Uh, in this slide, we have a number of different scenarios. Uh, the picture on the left-hand side is what we call armchair legs. And in this situation, it's typically the patient who is very immobile, does not go to bed at night, does not elevate their legs. They may have a degree of heart failure. Uh, and it's a dependency edema in that the edema is pooling in the foot and the leg because they're not elevating at all. And over time, this occurs uh, and leads to lymphatic disruption and a complication such as infection. So even in situations where perhaps originally there was not lymphatic failure, the consequences of somebody not being able to elevate and sitting in this position can lead to these kinds of skin changes. On the right hand of this slide, in the bottom picture, we see a different type of edema. In this case, it's somebody developing an acute heart failure. And we need to be reminded that some of the edemas we see are not chronic edemas, they're more acute and we need to understand the role of systemic conditions such as heart failure in causing peripheral edemas because clearly they need um, important medical management before we start to look at how we manage symptomatically the edema in their feet. Wound complications. Um, the, the whole um, speciality of lymphedema has grown up quite separately from the issues of wound services, particularly in this country. And yet recent work that I've done has shown that in the community particularly, and many of the community patients with leg ulceration have concurrent edema. And in fact, it's, it goes part and parcel with the pathological process. And so understanding that chronic edema and wound complications go together are very important. So if we look at the picture on the left-hand side here, we can see this is a patient with clear edema of the forefoot. And the wounds are a complication of inappropriate compression hosiery. So this is wound trauma as a consequence of inappropriate compression. And the picture on the right side, sadly, is a complication of a pressure ulceration occurring. And in this particular case, it's a patient with neuropathy as well. So we need to understand that chronic edema, its management and wounds go very much hand in hand. And that's why appropriate management is so very important. Again, another example, this again is a patient with spina bifida, and actually if you ignore the consequences of chronic edema, you can develop very significant wound problems as a result. You can see that there is very significant tissue changes occurring, and in this particular case there is infection in the nail bed that has led to an infection occurring in the bone and underlying osteomyelitis. But all of it's been aggravated by the fact that the compression therapy has not addressed toe swelling. So this is a complication, a consequence of compression therapy that's not used appropriately. So uh, let's think again, let's recap on some of these issues. Toe complications are a common complication of compression. And predominantly it's because compression therapy is not being used to control foot swelling and toe swelling. 
And importantly, to remind ourselves that when we are dealing with compression therapy and we're not applying enough compression to the foot, it will simply force edema into a non-compressed area. This is very important. This, by the very nature of this process, will lead to secondary tissue changes, uh, as you see in, in lymphedema patients. And as a consequence of that, problems such as mycosis or fungal infection are present in almost the majority of our patients in this situation. And from that, we have the problems of secondary cellulitis. And in patients with lymphedema, approximately half of the patients we see have an undergo underlying cellulitis problem. And once they've had an episode of cellulitis, they can have a recurrence rate of, of often 90%. So it's very important to think about this in terms of preventing this occurring um, by uh, identifying complications very early. These are some of the priorities of management and meticulous skin care is an absolute mandatory issue. Uh, these patients need to have um, skin hygiene every day. They need their feet, their legs, their toes washed, um, removal of ed any dead debris uh, between the toes and meticulous drying of skin folds. And it's the wet environment that stimulates the development of fungal infections. And when fungal infections do occur, they need to be treated um, with antifungal agents, um, creams, and they need to be treated for a number of weeks to prevent this from recurring. And this needs to be a daily application uh, to prevent this being a problem. We need to apply all of the principles of good wound management and particularly thinking about antimicrobial agents, preventing maceration from uh, products that uh, give too much moisture content at the wound surface, um, but importantly preventing wound trauma. There are times when um, we need to look at topical steroids, particularly if the skin becomes very eczematous, and this again can be a very useful ally. And control of infection is not just about these principles, it can also be about the role of antibiotics. So we are sometimes in the position of considering prophylactic antibiotics if people have recurrent episodes of cellulitis, and clearly this needs to be under the uh, good control of uh, a doctor looking after this patient. But underpinning all of this, these, all of these aspects are futile if we do not consider the continuous use of compression therapy to remove the excess edema and uh, allow good um, skin hygiene. So some examples of some of the challenges of managing the foot. Um, foot deformities are very common. Um, there is a whole range of reasons why this occurs. So it's very important to understand the role of neuropathy. We have many patients with concurrent diabetes who have um, sensory neuropathy, motor neuropathy, which means that we have to think differently about our care with compression therapy. Uh, in the top picture, you can see a patient with a foot deformity and a callus on the uh, lateral aspect of their foot. And calluses themselves can cause tissue damage and pressure damage um, under compression therapy. So we need to really understand and look at this every patient individually and holistically. For many of our patients, they've uh, a loss of calf muscle, so the shape becomes very distorted in these patients. And this is very fundamental when we think about how we're applying compression effectively to different patient groups. And the bottom picture, again, is an example of how forefoot swelling occurs simply because this patient has not been bandaged appropriately. And traditionally in the UK, many of the um, approaches to venous ulcer bandaging have been in to encourage people not to apply compression to the forefoot. This is a, is a myth. Um, it's based on the fear that too much compression uh, to the forefoot can cause pressure damage. But in fact, what happens in this situation is that the greatest pressure is applied around the ankle area, creating a tourniquet effect. And as you see in this picture, the accumulation of forefoot swelling. Um, so this is, this is, these are management issues uh, as much as they are pathological issues in these patients. So uh, I'm going to restate the importance of managing skin hygiene in these patients. Uh, it's not just about using soap and water. There are times when we have to use antiseptics, again, as part of our, our long-term prevention of fungal infection. Um, bacterial colonization can be influenced by um, use of products that control bacterial load in areas. And although the evidence base for this is not strong, our clinical impression is that this can be very, very helpful in these patients. Topical steroids are really um, used when you've got an acute eczema. Um, and can be very helpful in actually controlling eczema and controlling um, issues such as overgranulation in wounds. 
And treatment of osteomyelitis is the domain of the specialist and really needs aggressive management. Um, it may sometimes require even amputation of digits if the osteomyelitis cannot be solved. Um, but clearly these issues need to be understood by clinicians and put into a very effective care plan. So um, thinking about uh, how compression affects edema, uh, we need to understand that compression is for life. I mean, this is a message we need to get across to patients and also to professionals. It will only work when it's in contact with a limb. Uh, we know from the evidence that as soon as you remove compression, immediately you will get capillary filtration rates rising. And compression, the most fundamental effect of compression is a reduction in capillary filtration. And this is very, very important. It also has an effect on increasing lymphatic drainage and it shifts fluids to less compressed parts of the body. So one of the effects of compression therapy is to move fluid away from these areas and out into other healthy parts of the body. And we know from the literature that compression also improves the overall skin. It, break down, it breaks down fibrous sclerotic tissues. And so overall, some of the secondary skin changes we see in these patients can actually be reversed if we apply compression therapy effectively. There are also some new messages about compression I'd like to share with you. Um, compression is often feared by clinicians, and this is, is very sad because actually we know from new research undertaken by Professor um, Hugo Parch and Professor Mosty that actually we are we're quite timid about using compression. And their research that was undertaken in patients who had an ankle brachial pressure index of between 0.4 and 0.8 and were receiving inelastic compression of quite a high pressure, um, what they found that was the compression improved arterial inflow in patients with already established arterial disease. And they hypothesized that this is to do with reducing the arterial venous pressure gradient and also reducing the distance between nourishing capillaries. So we have been traditionally very conservative in our approaches of managing some of these patients. And clearly we need to be very um, careful about ensuring the arterial status of patients. But we can see from this research that actually we can be using it in many mixed etiology patient groups uh, with great safety and with great effect. Traditional ways of trying to manage patients with toe um, swelling particularly, this is an example of traditional toe bandaging using cotton bandages, again have focused on being able to get rid of excess edema. And again, it's very, very useful. And we're looking now at new materials that are addressing this in different ways. And uh, sadly, this is not something that has been done in the community very much. And this is, again, a very great challenge, but a very important challenge to change practice in terms of community care of these patients. But I'd also like to introduce you to the idea that compression is also very amenable to many complex situations. This is one of my patients. Um, this patient had lymphedema, a primary lymphedema, was born with a lymphatic dysplasia sadly ended up with an osteomyelitis and had, um, unfortunately, to have an amputation. And when he came to me, um, he was facing a life in a wheelchair, was unable to wear a prosthetic because they were unable to control his lymphedema, and he had a deep wound fistula. And everybody was very afraid about how to manage this patient and how to use compression therapy. And I was very honest with him. I said, look, I really want to try and use a new approach, a new material that I've been using that I think is, would be ideal for you. And my whole goal was to get this man um, very mobile, to get him into a prosthetic. So I decided to use the, the Coban system. And we actually trained this gentleman to self-bandage using the system, and he applied it every day himself. And we had fantastic results. We had wound healing within six weeks. And he's now in a prosthetic, and he still uses the system at night about twice a week to control the edema. But he's in a prosthetic, his mobility's improved, and his life has been transformed. So I think it's important not just about toe and foot edema, but to think about the other challenges in other uh, situations such as this, where, uh, where compression therapy is absolutely the pivotal factor in changing outcome. So I'd like to thank you. Um, I really want to reinforce that we really must focus on the importance of forefoot and toe edema and how we manage this effectively. Thank you. I'm Denise Hardy, Clinical Nurse Specialist in Kendall Lymphology Centre, talking today about toe and forefoot swelling, which we see commonly in lymphedema clinics. 
traditional compression bandage systems for chronic venous insufficiency and chronic edema or lymphedema do not always incorporate the toes and forefoot. This can cause a tourniquet at the dorsum of the foot, leading to backflow or refill of edema in the distal lymphatics at the extremity. If left untreated, the edema in these uncovered or decompressed areas become firm and fibrous as the protein-rich fluid becomes organised in the subcutaneous tissues. Once present, it is much more difficult to remove it from these areas and it can cause numerous problems with pain and discomfort, an increased risk of fungal infections, cellulitis, reduced foot function, posture, gait and footwear and clothing issues. So prevention is better than cure and most patients seen in lymphedema clinics will have the toes bandaged as well as the foot as a matter of course. Using the Coban 2 toe boot is an easy solution and can prevent the above uh, problems occurring. Many patients, particularly if the edema is mild to moderate, are issued with compression garments. To obtain improved and longer lasting results, the area should be treated with appropriate skin and nail care, manual lymphatic drainage, or MLD, and exercise alongside appropriate compression bandaging such as Coban 2. This regimen will help to break down any firm fibrotic tissues in the forefoot and toes, facilitate easier movement within the foot and the ankle, and ensure the compression garments fitted after bandaging work better, enhancing improved maintenance and optimization of the condition. If we look at these slides um, here, within three days or one application of bandaging with the Coban tube toe boot, there's marked improvement to the foot. Lymphorrhea has stopped, swelling has reduced, and the natural foot architecture is more apparent. It does, however, tend to highlight any underlying wounds as the edema reduces the cushioning and coverage does too expose vulnerable and abnormal tissues. This slide relates to children with primary congenital lymphedema or Milroy's disease and often have toe and foot swelling. Associated nail problems are commonly apparent with upward sloping nails, known as ski slope nails, which can prove difficult to cut and care for. Caution is therefore required so that damage to surrounding skin is avoided and chiropody or podiatry is recommended. The skin around the nail bed should be kept soft and supple. Organic coconut oil is perfect product to use this, and signs of infection should be promptly reported. Reducing the edema is possible with Coban 2, bandaging to the knee, incorporating a toe boot, which also helps to soften the nails before cutting. Sometimes in severe cases where the nails cause recurrent infection, the nails are surgically removed. Fungal infections such as athlete's foot are common in patients with foot and toe swelling. Swollen toes that are squashed together in a stocking or a bandage can generate a warm, moist atmosphere for fungal infections to thrive. If left untreated, it can lead to a bacterial infection and cellulitis, which in turn can further damage the swelling and lead to the patient being very unwell. Prevention is better than cure, and the area should be kept as clean and dry as possible. Strict daily hygiene should be incorporated ensuring the digits are scrupulously clean and dry. Use of diluted tea tree oil in the bath or between the toes can help prevent attacks. If present, the fungal infection should be treated by a suitable preparation. Cotton compression garments should be considered, and if bandaging is being used, a cotton stockinette may be used beneath the problematic area. Toe spacers also help, using folded pieces of comfort layer between the toes. The stem sign is the inability to pick up a fold of skin at the base of the second toe. It is a positive sign that there is a lymphostatic disease. However, a negative sign does not rule out a diagnosis of lymphedema. When present, the tissues have become hard, firm and fibrous. The natural creases and folds are enhanced and hardened. The surrounding skin is often very dry and cracked, leading to the risk of inf infection. Warts Viral infections that can easily invade through the skin through small cuts or abrasions are common in lymphedema as the limb is immunocompromised. They are contracted by walking barefoot on infected surfaces where the virus is lurking and they are particularly common in children as they often pick up the virus from communal bathing facilities or swimming pools. They're known as plantar warts if present on the soles of the feet and tend to be hard, flat and uncomfortable, particularly when present on overweight bearing areas of the foot. When present on the top of the foot, they tend to be generally raised and fleshier in appearance. 
All type supports are very resistant to treatment and have a tendency to reoccur. If left untreated, they can grow to 2.5 centimetres in circumference or spread into clusters of several warts, often called mosaic warts. And of course, they spread very easily by touching, scratching or sharing towels. They do need treating, though sometimes they can disappear spontaneously on their own, as they can become painful and cause embarrassment. They're also a source of a bacterial infection too, cellulitis, which can worsen the condition. Treatment will also reduce the risk of them spreading to other areas or other people. Patients with lymphedema, diabetes, circulatory, neurological or immunological diseases should be especially careful with the treatment of their warts and seek medical help. A poor bandage application due to lack of education, training or use of inappropriate bandaging systems can lead to numerous problems for patients, including infection, maceration, ulceration, pain, loss of function and problems with posture, balance and gait. It can even lead to amputation on occasion. Wounds that are resistant to healing should be reported and an alternative treatment sought. Constant re-evaluation should take place. Improvement should be noted or not, as the case may be. A full holistic assessment of the wound, skin, tissues, pain, etc. are essential before treatment is initiated. This should include vascular and neurological assessment. Bandages should be just be part of the care plan. It should also include skin and wound management, dietary advice and an appropriate exercise program. Application of the Coban 2 toe boot is a simple solution that can be adopted by many. This is the application of the comfort layer over the toes and the foot. This is followed by the compression layer until finally the bandage is applied towards the knee. Thank you for watching this webcast. We hope you found it informative. Should you have any other questions, then please do not hesitate to contact us at c3sd at mmm.com or telephone 01509 611 611. Thank you.